Hello friends and welcome to a brand new episode of Economic Sutra. This is a part of a two-part series on the economic history of India. This two-part series is a part of the Bharat Ek Soch effort that is being done by Sangsar TV as a part of the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav celebrations that are happening across India. So as a part of this wider celebration, we are going to look at India's economic history. In the first episode, we will look at the period from the 1940s to 1991. And then in the subsequent episode, we will look at the period from 1991 to 2022. So when India became independent, it was a poor, impoverished former colony. It was largely agricultural. And of course, there were all these disruptions which had been caused by partition. Nonetheless, India did inherit some industrial capacity. There were two industrial hubs. One was in and around Kolkata, or what was then called Calcutta. And one was around Bombay, now called Mumbai. There were, of course, other scatterings of industrial capacity and, of course, the railway backbone as well. Nonetheless, India was indeed a very poor country and there were a lot of concerns about how to get India's poor out of poverty as soon as possible. But a fashionable idea of that time, inspired by the Soviet Union, was to opt for socialist planning. Now, there was so much enthusiasm about this that there was a lot of pressure on the drafters of the Indian constitution to include the word socialism in the preamble of the Indian constitution. In fact, Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru was a big advocate of this line of thinking. Nonetheless, the chairman of the drafting committee of the constitution, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, flatly refused. It's quite interesting to go back and look at his thinking of why he refused to include the word socialism in the constitution. His argument was that the way our society was arranged, the uh, socio-economic architecture of a particular point in time depended on the circumstances of the time. It would be wrong, he argued, to enshrine it in stone in the preamble of the constitution. So he refused and the very first version of the constitution did not include the word socialism in the preamble. Now, this did not deter Prime Minister Nehru. He formed a planning commission as early as 1950, and they set about creating the five-year plans based on which the economy would be uh, managed. The very first plan uh, concentrated mostly on agriculture, which was fair enough, but it did set in motion the whole process of uh, top-down economic management and planning by the Indian state. And very early on, in 1953, we begin to see a wave of nationalization uh, uh, taking root. The, one of the first industries that was nationalized were the airlines, which was considered at that time at being at the cutting edge of technology. And so in 1953, you see Air India, which was then owned by the Tatas, being nationalized but several other airlines as well. For example, Kalinga Airways, now not much remembered, um, which was owned by Biju Patnaik, uh, the politician adventurer uh, of Orissa. Now, that process of nationalization then gathered pace. And so, uh, by the uh, uh, mid-1950s, you see more and more of these nationalizations happen. A particularly important one was that of the Life Insurance Corporation or LIC, which had been formed by the amalgamation of a several private sector uh, insurance companies. And when the LIC was nationalized, it meant that suddenly the Indian state came in control of a huge amount of resources. Not surprisingly, this opened up uh, the space for misuse and rent seeking. 
And indeed, within months of LIC being um, nationalized, you saw some of these monies being diverted to private ends. This led to a huge scandal, the Mundra scandal, which was the first big financial scandal of independent India. Interestingly, it was brought to light by none other than Prime Minister Nehru's own son-in-law, Firoz Gandhi, who exposed this scandal, and as a result of which, the then finance minister, T.T. Krishnamachari, was forced to resign. Despite this setback, however, Prime Minister Nehru was not deterred at all. He carried on, strengthened the planning commission, he hired a statistician, P.C. Mahalanobis, to set about planning the Indian economy in as much detail as possible. Now note that uh, Professor Mahalanobis was not an economist, uh, nor had he had any experience with managing uh, economic policy before he was put in charge of running the Indian economy. His, uh, most of his previous experience had been in applying statistics to anthropological uh, pursuits. Nonetheless, Professor Mahalanobis set about this by creating first a very simple two by two model, which included a model of how to deal with uh, the problem of ramping up uh, capital uh, goods industries in the country, and to bypass, while doing this, the problem of insufficient savings in the economy. So you see this very simple two by two model, which was later expanded to a 10 by 10 model, and those of you who are sort of uh, studying economics will be quite amused to hear that this model had no prices in it. It was purely a physical model of input and output. And based on this model, uh, an economic policy were, uh, framework was put in place that essentially diverted the uh, meager savings of the Indian economy of that time into these massive capital intensive projects. Some of these projects uh, were uh, public sector enterprises, but a big uh, chunk of this resource was diverted towards building these huge dams. So here is uh, what a news clip from that time had to say about one of these large dams, the Hirakun Dam. The Hirakun Dam in the Indian state of Orissa is the longest in the world, three miles long in fact. Flying in the Russian plane given him by the Soviet leaders and their goodwill tour, Premier Nehru came to perform the inauguration of this great project. It aims at abolishing the fear of flood and famine in the state and providing enough irrigation to produce 200,000 tons of extra food annually. All this through harnessing the waters of the turbulent river Mahanadi. In addition to the dams, new public sector enterprises were set up as well. One of these was the Hindustan Machine Tools or HMT, which of course produced all kinds of things from capital goods to tractors, but the average Indian would know it as the manufacturer of a very popular set of mechanical watches. Those of you who are above the age of 50 uh, perhaps owned one of these watches uh, when you were younger. <laughs> HMT. Meanwhile, while all these resources were being diverted to building these big capital intensive industries and dams and so on, there was some amount of private sector in investment still going on. It was of course heavily restricted, it had to be restricted because otherwise by the thinking of the time, it would gobble up too much of the country's savings. So a very elaborate system of licenses and permits was created in order to hold them in check, so to speak. And C. Raja Gopalachari, or Rajaji is better known, termed this as license permit Raj or quota license permit Raj. So it is important to remember that this entire approach of 
socialist planning wasn't something that everybody accepted. There were people like Lajaji arguing right in the 1950s that this would lead to a bureaucratic, inefficient system. Nonetheless, a few private sector companies did manage to get licenses and some new technologies and products were indeed introduced. One of these was the Ambassador car, which was taken from the Morris Oxford from the UK and was then mass produced in India. And it would effectively become for the next four decades the way Indians thought of cars. Of course, it did have a competitor in the form of the Fiat designed Premier Padmini. But nonetheless, the Ambassador car came to define motor vehicles in India. Here is its first ad or one of its first ads back from the 1950s. Despite all the effort that was put into socialist planning, however, economic performance continued to be patchy. Growth continued to fluctuate quite a lot and there were bouts of very high inflation. And you see these being uh, an issue repeated in many of the speeches of the political leaders of the time, including that of Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru. <laughs> चीजों के दाम बढ़े उसका असर सारी फॉर्म पर चाहे आप तनखा लेते हैं या कुछ और तरह से रहते हैं एक दाम बढ़ते जाते हैं खाने का सवाल खाने की कमी राशनिंग और क्या-क्या बातें आईं और आप आप परेशान हुए और आप लोगों ने या मुल्क ने अक्सर शिकायत की और जा शिकायत की क्योंकि परेशानी की शिकायत करनी है लेकिन एक ऐसे जकड़ गए हम उसमें कुछ तो और दुनिया के वाकयात अगर वहां कोरिया में लड़ाई हो तो उसका असर यहां पर जाता है चीजों के भाव पर हमारे खाबू के बाहर बात बाय द 1960s इट वाज क्वाइट ऑबवियस दैट द सोशलिस्ट मॉडल ऑफ इकोनॉमिक ग्रोथ वाज नॉट सक्सीडिंग देयर वर ऑलरेडी कंट्रीज इन ईस्ट एशिया दैट वर लीपिंग अहेड बट मोर इंपॉर्टेंटली बैक हियर इन इंडिया there were a series of droughts in the mid 60s and this led to severe food shortages even fears of a return to famine and indian prime minister shastri of that time and then followed by prime minister indira gandhi had to effectively go begging for food and you saw large food shipments being made under this pl 480 scheme from the united states as you can imagine this was a humiliating moment as a result of which a major effort was put in to introduce new forms of farming into india we would know this as the green revolution much of these technologies incidentally had been experimented with by an indian agro scientist called pandurang khankoji who had been a revolutionary uh, and had then gone on to settle in mexico he came in in the 1950s and 60s to india and introduced many of these new ideas to indian uh, farmers despite this that would eventually of course pay dividends for the time being the economy was floundering and more and more efforts were being put in to try and somehow bolster it the rupee was devalued more importantly in 1969 prime minister indira gandhi nationalized the entire banking system the excuse was that the banking system only served the purposes of the rich and required to be diverted to the purposes of the poor in other words it was done in the name of the poor and this was very much a part of the growing socialist agenda of the then prime minister who was of course fighting opponents within her own party so the nationalization of banks placed in the hands of the indian state a huge amount of financial resources which of course were again increasingly diverted to the public sector this didn't help the economy the economy continued to flounder into the early 70s of course the oil shock of 1973 had a big impact inflation again spiked up the economic difficulties however did not stop the political rhetoric of socialism far from it 
The political leadership of that time doubled down on it. The elections of 1971 were held on the slogan of Garibi Hatao. The oil shock of 1973 was a very difficult time for India. Yet again, growth floundered, inflation spiked up. The response yet again was even more control of the economy. Not only were there a continuation of the old license system that had now got quite entrenched, there was a control over all the financial resources through the nationalization of the banks, and now income tax was jacked up very dramatically. In fact, for some period of time, the marginal top rate of income tax reached 97.5%. In other words, somebody earning 100 rupees would hand over 97.5 rupees uh, on an incremental basis to the Indian uh, tax collector. With the economy continuing to flounder, however, the political situation in the country begin, began to deteriorate. And this was one of the contributing factors why emergency was introduced in 1975. The introduction of the emergency, however, did not improve the economic situation, although it, some people would argue that some of the public services were indeed for a while uh, provided a little bit better. The socialist rhetoric was ramped up even further. Prime Minister Indira Gandhi further doubled down on the so socialist pla planning process. She introduced the 42nd Amendment by which the word socialist was finally introduced into the constitution. Remember, the original Ambedkar constitution did not include this in the preamble. It was introduced in 1976 as part of the 42nd Amendment, along with, of course, the word secularism. I do want to point out at this juncture that this entire period of economic uh, management under a socialist framework and its many failures was not entirely dark. There were certain new ideas, technologies, etc. that were introduced. For example, the space program, the atomic program were introduced at this time. So was, incidentally, Doordarshan the first time that Indians saw television. And those of you who were born before 1980, perhaps will remember this black and white uh, introduction opening theme song of Doordarshan that you may have seen. In addition to the introduction of Doordarshan, there were other new things that were also coming about. One of them was mass transportation in the form of the Bajaj scooter. And many of you, you who were around at that time will remember uh, being taken by your dad to school, perhaps standing uh, in front of him on the Bajaj scooter. So here is the very popular ad from that time, Hamara Bajaj. <laughs> 
this bajaj ad is from the 1980s but nonetheless captures the mood ye aasma ha ye zameen ye aasma hamara kal hamara aaj hamara kal hamara aaj buland bharat ki buland tasveer hamara bajaj hamara bajaj बुलंद भारत की बुलंद तस्वीर हमारा बजाज हमारा बजाज इन एडिशन टू दूरदर्शन एंड बजाज स्कूटर्स अनदर मेमोरी फ्रॉम दैट टाइम इज द पॉपुलैरिटी ऑफ आमूल which is still around of course but it is really in the 1970s that it became widely available amul butter amul cheese and so on and it was part of the white revolution uh, by which milk production and distribution was revolutionized in the country your attention please you may unfasten your seat belt and smoke if you wish breakfast will be served you in time thank you non vegetarian thank you sir the packet of amul butter please what a sweet child here you are darling thank you <laughs> excuse me yes can i have your packet of amul butter please thank you saying. can i have your packet of amul butter please yes yaar amul butter please oh, yeah. thank you give me your amul butter no mm. Excuse me. Can I have your packet of amul butter, please? You're not allowed in here, baby. For amul butter, some people don't know where to stop. Amuling, amuling, delicious. Hmm, amul. With political and economic conditions continuing to deteriorate, Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. finally decided to remove emergency new elections were called and a brand new government came to power under the banner of the janta party now the janta party of course reversed many of the changes that uh, had been put in place during the previous uh, regime uh, many constitutional amendments were rolled back however economic planning and socialist policies were not one of them if anything they increased the amount of uh socialist planning uh, that was being done and um, you saw for example the fundamental right to property in fact being downgraded to just being a legal right similarly uh, multinational companies were pushed out very famously coca cola was pushed out of the country it was then replaced by uh indigenous uh, brands uh, some of those brands uh were had colorful names like double uh, 7 or 77 of course named after uh, their famous victory in 1977 uh, there was the brand of uh, campa cola uh, there was also a brand thumbs up which is of course the only of those brands that is still alive today ironically owned by coca cola now all of this continued to be a problem because um there was still no new technologies being introduced investment was floundering and of course then india was hit by the second oil shock in the middle of that the government changed and prime minister indira gandhi stormed back to power the economic problems that had beset india over the last several uh decades however it was not something that was recognized as flowing however from poor planning and economic management the intellectual climate of that time however continued to have a great amount of faith in this socialist approach so much so 
that the poor economic performance of the previous several decades was dubbed the Hindu rate of growth of 3.5%. And as you can imagine, with population growing at little over 2%, this meant that per capita incomes were only growing by a little over 1% per annum. Now, by dubbing it in this way as the Hindu rate of growth, the narrative that was being put forward was that it was not that socialism had failed India, but somehow India and its cultural moorings had failed socialism. And so, when Indira Gandhi came back to power, she took the next step in increasing her control over the economy and carried out yet another round of nationalization of banks. So, the 1980s, in the beginning at least, did not see any new economic paradigm being introduced. The complex system of licenses, permits, bureaucratic control naturally led to shortages and inflation. I've already mentioned this many times. But one of the real problems was the second order effects it had on Indian society. For example, black markets thrived. Smuggling thrived. There was a very famous smuggler called Haji Mastan in Mumbai, who became quite a well-known character of that time. In addition to this, there were industrial strikes all over India, whether in Kolkata or in uh, Mumbai. Very large-scale industrial action happened. Many, many large factories shut down, never to open again. In fact, those of you who are familiar with Mumbai's uh, Parel area, the old mills of that time, uh, basically shut down during the early 80s when there were a series of large industrial strikes. Similar thing happened in Kolkata as well. You saw the industrial hub around Kolkata suffer from severe strikes um, from which essentially Kolkata never really recovered. By the mid-1980s, however, the mood finally began to change. And in some ways, symbolic of that change in mood was the introduction of a car, the Maruti 800. This was produced by a joint venture between an Indian company, an Indian public sector company called Maruti and Japan Suzuki. And those of my generation who were teenagers at that time vividly remember how this car was introduced. It was a whiff of fresh air introducing a new technology well beyond what was available at that time in the form of the ambassador. And of course, it, it had much more than just uh, about uh, transportation. It was about freedom and it talked about new possibilities that were there. Many of us learned to drive a car on that 800. Uh, many of us went out um, on long drives. The first time I was allowed to take uh, a car out on my own were, was my dad's uh, Maruti 800. So uh, this car has enormous meaning to uh, us and um, the very very first uh, Maruti 800 that was uh, sold uh, is still around. Uh, so let's go and have a look at it. Hi, my name is Sashank Chavasta. I'm the Senior Executive Director at Maruti Suzuki India Limited. What you see here is the very first Maruti Suzuki car which was sold in India to a couple in Green Park in New Delhi. Today, we are celebrating 75 years of our country's independence. Azadi ka Amrit Mahotsav. And out of that, 40 years is what Maruti Suzuki has seen in India. And in fact, I remember in, when Maruti Suzuki was introduced and the first car was made sometime in 1983-84, at that time, the annual sales of cars in India was just 50,000 cars. Today, in fact, in this very month, 350,000 cars will be sold in one month alone. And that's a real big progress. And that's also the progress of our economy that, that has been seen. The auto industry 
obviously is a very important part of the economy. 7.5% of the GDP actually comes from automobile. But it's not just the number of cars which are sold, but look at our exports, for example. We had all, zero exports uh, when Maruti Suzuki started. Today, in India, this industry sells 750,000 cars every year. And that's a huge progress. But we are not talking only about numbers, volumes, or even exports. If you see, the total auto industry, including the ancillary industries connected with, with the, the cars, have changed dramatically, be it transportation industry or the after-sales service industry. And that's a huge progress. What I feel is that today, when we are looking at the past 40 years, we can be very proud. But I believe the next 75 years will, will take India to much greater heights. Today, Maruti Suzuki has been sold in at least 407,000 villages of our country out of the 640,000 villages that we have. And that is testimony to the fact that the spread of our prosperity is an economic activity is not just limited to the bigger cities, but has spread across the length and breadth of our country. The changing mood of the 80s, embodied by the Maruti, of course, was not limited to this car alone. You see that in many, many other facets. Remember, by this time, of course, Doordarshan had also switched to color. Many of us, for the first time, were watching television in color. Uh, very often, we visited our friends' homes who may have had a color television. And some of you, at least, will remember the advertisements that began to pop up uh, in the late 80s. These advertisements, again, talked of a new ethos of enterprise and possibilities of new consumer goods that were suddenly becoming available in India at that time. So there were ads for Liril, uh, the soap. Uh, there were ads for Nirma, the washing powder, uh, and so on and so forth. <laughs> Optimism of the late 80s under Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi did bring in a degree of fresh air. However, this did not dismantle the inefficiencies of the old license permit Raj. Instead, growth was being driven ever more by taking on more debt, particularly from foreign sources. As a result of which, by 1990, India had become way too indebted and this led ultimately to the economic crisis of 1991, when a small spike in oil prices tripped the Indian economy into a downward spiral. And we had a major crisis in 1990-91, as a result of which ultimately we were forced to liberalize and open up our economy. So that's all for now in this episode of Economic Sutra. See you in the next episode, which will be about the period 1991 to 2022. So see you there at Economic Sutra on Sunset TV. In the next episode 
of this two-part series, we are going to explore what happened in 1991, the reforms that happened subsequently, and the dramatic change that happened in our economy from the 90s through to the today, 2022, and of course, the many adventures along the way from the construction of large-scale uh, infrastructure to, of course, the very difficult times uh, that we had during the COVID pandemic of 2020 to 2022.